The Last Pine Productions presents the New Way podcast. The New Way contains adult content, including Game of Thrones, again, and not even for the last time. This episode is about docudramas, not tits and dragons. We can only wish that a true story would one day be told about tits and dragons, but there won't, because they don't exist. What? What's that? Tits are real? Seriously? Shit. You gotta give me some tits. Listener discretion is advised. A sneak attack would be counted to what the United States stands for. And the inevitable Soviet response would force us into a war. Americans traditionally love to fight. All real Americans love the sting of battle. Get out of here, Dewey. What are y'all doing in here? We're smoking reefer. And you don't want no part of this shit. Everybody wants to be naked and famous. Everybody wants to be just like me and naked. Will you help teach me about this? Hello and welcome to the New Way Podcast with Ben and Matt and sometimes Nick. Uh, we are and sometimes other people. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes Paul. Sometimes, sometimes Ryan. Paul, sometimes. But you know what? We were else. we were turned down this week. Uh, both of us, separate from one another, invited Paul to be on the on the uh, podcast, and we were turned down. Um, and it. It hurts to feel like just another one of well, Paul's women, uh, let, doesn't let's, it? Let's go through the proper protocol here. First, <laughs> first it's Nick. And when Nick says no, we say, well, we have to invite somebody else to be on the podcast. And depending on the topic, it's usually Kevin and Paul are our next two, right. depending Although I on did, what we were talking I, about. I did throw out a Hail Mary and said, Ryan, if you would like to call in, you're welcome oh, to. Oh, what uh, happened? I, I, I think he just said uh, – did he tell us to go fuck ourselves? Because well, well, that's rude. When, when I said what we were talking about, um, and we'll, which we'll get to in a little bit, he asked if he could talk about the Mighty Ducks. Okay. And I said, <laughs> that doesn't really apply to our topic. But, no. And he just said, don't discriminate. And wow. So I, I took that as- He took a really a, hard line on that. That's kind of yeah. amazing. I told him he could talk about boobs if he wanted to. Boobs. We can always talk about that. I spelled it like boobs, too. That's how you should always spell boobs is the B-E-W-B-Z. Oh. Uh, B-S. Oh, you did the – I said I did the boobs with with the Z. I like that Z at the end. So you fall asleep at the end of the boob. (laughs) Off. If if, God willing, (laughs) that's how I go go every night, but uh, but not always. (laughs) Um, Yes, thank you for tuning in to the New Way podcast. Uh, Hopefully you you enjoyed last week's spoiler-laden episode because I got to be honest with you. Uh, for this week, it is it is another uh, weekend in May, and that means we have more Game of Thrones to talk and spoil for you. Um, oh, great! So, by the way, that is also just the greatest. Like, is it? Don't you want to hear yeah, that every time you sure orgasm? Am. Don't you like every time you're like, oh, I'm almost there. And then you just you you stride I, I, right I, I, into I, I, it right I, I, there. I, I would prefer not not an <laughs> orgasm point. I prefer that to be just like right when the you know <laughs> right, right 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 when right when the lava lamp comes on. <laughs> no, it should be. It should just be like every big moment. Like congratulations, it's a baby boy. And yes, then there you, you have it, whatever you want in there. Uh, we can use it. But yeah, we, we do need to talk. Uh, we apologize. For the next three weeks, at least, we're going to be talking about Game of Thrones each Sunday. We will wait. Oh, you'll be listening mm. to this a week after the episode. Um, but yeah, there's no way to not talk about the end of this saga and this show. And, and I, and so we'll I, briefly touch on that for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll be starting off the episode. If you want to skip ahead, um, skip I'll let ahead. you know in the, in the notes, uh, of the show, what, what moment to skip forward to in the show. But, um, all right. So I really, really want to discuss this week's episode because I was, I was a little bit upset at a certain plot development that Ben disagreed with me being upset about. Oh, that's right. We, about. we haven't really discussed this yet. I also have to apologize uh, to Nick for accidentally spoiling this moment because I forgot he was on a group text thread and he's in Los Angeles now and three hours behind us. So I did spoil a, a bit of a moment in the Game of Thrones. But um, let's talk about the things I liked, I guess, what we liked in the episode, kind of just in general. I want to kind of start in that. I think... I like what they're doing with um, making our heroes very fallible and not necessarily 
they're doing good plot things that make sense now. Like they, they did something this week I thought was the best argument for how they're structuring it by making the White Walker threat first is that they come off of this this White Walker win and they're all just fucking cocky. Like right. they're all like we did this. And, and then they immediately just plant the, like sow the seeds of discord. Yes. Like every everyone is out for their own reasons and all of a sudden even family members are like, well, we're kind of going to have to pit everybody against one another. And, yeah. and that, and I do like that. And I think that that's an underrated development of what the, the show was not very, or this episode was not very, uh, was not re- well received. I, yeah. I feel like kind of generally. And I, I understand because of a lot of the plot mechanisms, but I think ultimately the setup of the beginning of the episode was fantastic because it yes. immediately says you're, you're watching, people underhandedly play against one another. You're watching Sansa and Daenerys kind of play against one another. We're in the game. Yeah, they're, they're, and so they're back in the game. And yeah, so right now we're talking about like, this is Rockets, you know, uh, Warriors. It's it's the, <laughs> it's the game six, man. It's, it's it, I, I don't it, know what these references are about, but I, I assume it's a... The NBA it's playoffs a, are it's going a Highland, on right now. It's a Highland book I think you're talking the, about. The, but, the NBA yeah. playoffs are going on right now. This is a sports yeah. reference. Oh, God. Sports. Oh, no. So anyways, uh, but essentially, and John is kind of just being John, which is... Yeah. Daenerys and Sansa both hate at this point, I think. Well, and I love, and I mean, Daenerys is on her slide, her slow slide into Mad madness, Queen, which is yeah. great. Um, but yeah, I, I think they, I think they go, they also, they fly into this battle yeah. when they're feeling, you know, pretty good about themselves from their victory. And of course, they suffer an immediate and fast. Uh, setback, a couple of immediate fast and setbacks on it, and that's also just a great setup for Cersei too to be like, oh, you beat the you beat the the White Walkers, that's great, but yeah. you you haven't you can't beat me because I am worse than everyone else combined. Um, so there were two moments that got a lot of publicity in this episode. I don't, I honestly did not see a lot of people that were upset about the thing that I was upset about, and, and actually most of the people that were watching it with me that night all had a similar dislike for something but there was a, a moment earlier on that i know benioff and weiss got a lot of uh heat for which is sansa talking to the hound and talking about how the the basically if these things these horrible things hadn't happened to me i would still be i'd still be that little bird and i know they took a lot of heat for saying that her just making her motivation being raped and all of these things being like that's the only reason she's powerful is because she went through all of this shit and I, 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 I did. I mean, honestly, I think that that's just a fool's argument. Everyone is going to find a way, and I understand why sure. people would be empowered to, to feel like they should complain about that. But when you see the deadness in her eyes when she says that line, it's not even in jest. It's like she, she, she means it. She's a hard bitch now. Yes, but I think it's more of a character moment. I think it's it doesn't has nothing to do with how she's powerful. I think it has to do with. I, th- I think it's a clever line to say to somebody like the Hound, who sure. is completely desensitized at this point, and whose only real saving grace was his connection to the Stark girls with, with, with Arya yeah. and with Sansa, and 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 who legitimately stuck up, like stuck up for them at points. I, I think, yeah, I think it's I, I in that case, I think it's people reading into the exact wording of the line, yeah, and not so much about the character because really, yeah, exactly. any any character in the show could have the exact same line. I mean, the exactly. Hound could talk about how he would wouldn't be who he is if he was not burned and disfigured by his bro you know of course yeah. all these things everyone's had sh- this is a world where everyone is shit upon at some point you know the same as e- even like Theon Greyjoy you could say that kind of stuff but I of course I understand there's a sensitivity about making it a young girl and making this rape thing be kind of this very kind of formative experience for her but the but the the moment I had a bigger issue with um, which most people of course have been shipping it for a long time and I understand the argument as well that there's long setup for this was uh, Brienne and yeah, Jamie getting together and I, I, so I, I, I'll, I'll try to kind of figure out why because I mean I it was something that I instantly when it happened I was just like no it, it just it very much felt wrong to me and then the way it's tied up, I get what they're doing, but it it felt like a moment that was serving to build out Jamie's either how he's going to be be atoned for everything or to go slip side back into his old way. It felt like it was a moment that happened in order to give his character something to do, almost like the fridging argument that there's a, that there's this this thing that has to happen and. 
and f- it, I think part of it is that it, it because as soon as it's over, he's like, yeah, I'm not in love with you. I didn't. This isn't. You're not anything to me. Okay, so what's Ben? Ben's signaling things to me. No, I'm just it, saying. I believe I, it looked I, like he was playing I, a piano. I, 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 I don't necessarily agree that. I think that that's what he said. I don't think that's necessarily what he means. You don't think that he's still completely in love with Cersei? No, hmm. I think he's going back to kill her. He might, but I think he's still in love with her. I think he's still if struggling. He with says, that. "I'm I'm a hateful person." That's yeah. his last thing, and I think that he hates what he was, and I think he hates who he is, and the fact that he was part of that for such a long time. I think he's going back to make amends. I, he, I think he ultimately Jamie is is going to be dead at the end. I think no matter what. Uh, my my opinion. Yeah. Here's the thing. I'm 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 also. I have a different context because I'm in the midst, in the current midst of a rewatch. Yeah. And we literally, just before this episode, we are in the middle of season four. Episode one, season four, uh, Cersei a- says, uh, she's asking why she protected Jamie, And she said, well, it was my duty or whatever. But she goes, you're in love with him. And it's this very long, awkward moment. And she walks away. Yeah, I, no, so and, I'm not. So, I am not contesting that Brienne but, but, is in love with no, no, Jamie. No, no, but, but, but. The thing that we don't realize, if you look back on this, is that there are lots of long, like very strange gazes from. Jamie is very interested in Brienne. I know that yes. you, your your whole opinion is that he loves her as a person, but he can't. But see now, I see. I think that's almost even a little bit more insulting to the character because then it's just saying, why can't you be physically attracted to Brienne? I just I have not the way he has played it the way his character has always played it has always been sly he's always been a little bit he's he's flirty with so there are moments in that show specifically where he is flirty with her in a way that suggests that he is he is Jamie Lannister this handsome rogue knight and she's this kind of mannish you know tomboyish character on that right, and right. he's playing into that constantly in the show of like I am I am I am better than you. This is this doesn't make sense. This is a this is a sitcom, you know, uh where there's like the the Kevin it's James and couple. Leah Remini, right? Yeah, it's an odd couple. Um I just I didn't I, I felt like I couldn't understand his motivations for doing because it's also just coming off of a terrible scene for her where Tyrion is a, a piece of shit, to be honest. It makes the terrible joke about her virginity and which is Tyrion. Right. I mean that's what Tyrion does. Um, but yeah, it's this awkward moment for her where she's kind of devastated coming off of these really big, happy moments for her. And then she has this thing that she's wanted for so long. And it seems to me that if, if you're right, if Jamie is really in love with her in that way, then that's even, to me, it's even worse that he sleeps with her and then goes off to his death without talking to her or sharing any emotions. Cause it doesn't make, I guess you can't just say, you can't just answer everything. It was, well, it's game of Thrones. Like it, it doesn't, it seems like it's a, a moment that's self self self-serving for him. For the person who has the biggest arc in the show, (laughs) I do think it would be a very game of Thrones thing to say, he you, at the end his arcs his his nature still felt unredeemable and he had to sacrifice himself to to pay penance for that and I think that that is a big Game of Thrones thing and so because everyone wants but to root knows everyone that. wants to root like, for again, Jamie but that's now. A, but the, the problem is that that's that doesn't if okay so so let's say you're with someone and you're you don't necessarily reciprocate the feelings you the, in the way that you know they do so maybe we can even boil it down to that he may be interested in her in a certain way but she is she is a, in an obsession with him there is no one else Tormund doesn't isn't even a, a a possibility for her she has eyes for one human being sure I think that you have a a per, a care a person has a responsibility not to take advantage of that situation even if you think you're doing it for magnanimous reasons or anything it just it it something about everything I, that happened it just did not I, work for me so so, so I, and like i said i i respect i think i respect the understanding understanding that's not coming from a place of being like she didn't um, if Watching it now and rewatching yeah. these old moments, it fe- still feels earned to me. Now I understand you saying it's you don't feel like it's a good character moment, uh, but I think that that, like I said again, my whole thing is that why not? Why they've been building up to it? it why, why, why can't it be? Because they are they all they've, they've been doing for four seasons is long gazes between the two of but them. But I mean, so I, I also I think the other problem is that I'm I'm also comparing it against another very recent 
deflowering and that show that happens in a completely different way that is completely serving of the female character. And you could argue they're almost the exact same thing just from opposite gender standpoints. But Arya, Arya and Gendry. So Arya does the same thing to Gendry, right? I mean, that Jamie does to Brienne, essentially, which is basically like, I mean, except that she's our Arya's control of that situation, being like, hey, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to die tomorrow. And then they don't die. And then she's like, well, I don't, <laughs> I'm not what you're looking for. This is not who I am. This is, I'm going on to do my thing. I, I, I would say that, that both Brian and Jamie are in control of that situation. I mean, I think that they both, I mean, they, they are, they are equally undressing one another. That, that is the point of that, of that sequence. They, there's a, <sighs> they are talking and undressing one another. I do not see Brienne as the instigator of that situation. I, the, I don't ever see her being the instigator of that situation. Not like Arya. Arya is literally like, no, we are doing this, but I, Jamie I comes to put Arya, the move on her. But, but, but that, that's not, yeah, that's not the point of the scene. I mean, no, I, but I'm just saying, like, I don't think, I don't think that moment happens unless Jamie walks in that room and says, we're doing this. I don't think there's any version of it where it's but in that case, Brienne but, but Brienne as a character never would do anything like that. So, no. that, 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 so that, that, that's the point. I mean, no, I, but that's what, but that, again, that's what I'm, I just, I feel that it, I don't know, just I, something I, I, about I, I, it I, makes well, me so what you're saying feel is less you, you, good you, about you, her character. And it makes me feel like that it was a moment done so that Jamie's arc is a little saucier as he goes off to his death. And I'm telling you that they've been setting this up since season four. It, it's very clear. Like, it is uh, exceptionally clear. In the first episode of season four, where he's like, you're in love with her. And she wa- she kind of just does her little nod and walks away uh, with this very awkward look on her face. And it's obvious that she's in love. And then later that episode, you see Jamie with this long kind of, not a longing, but just like that interested, like, Imagine if I could be, and I think he's envious of Brienne. I ultimately, I think what's it he's envious of Brienne because Brienne is pure, and Brienne is so is such a strong person, and has a, is such a strong will and a strong dedication to what it is that she feels is right. Ultimately, I think that's what Jamie is a Jamie is attracted to about her, even more so than her as as yeah. th- this battle tested you know warrior. I I, 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 I just I, I think that he goes in there and in, in, in his mind he's helping make up for what happened. So let me put it this way: Does that so moment he feels bad for Brienne? Does that moment not right? Now, I feel like your argument really d- discredits oh, Brienne a lot. Well, but here's my okay. Here's my question: I have a serious question. If Tyrion doesn't make that joke, do they sleep together that night? Sure. Really. You yeah. think that that happens without this big moment that pushes Jamie into having to go realize that that Tyrion just hurt this girl and he's going in there. I don't see. I just don't see it. It just. I don't. I don't. And yeah, I know I that's a does. big what if, but like I don't know. Like I said, and I was watching with three girls who are all also just like, what the fuck is this? Like this is re- like no, like they're like going no my, no no my, no. My no. wife was very excited. I understand. I that saying everyone. I, I'm saying I mean, not, I, not 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 actually excited. Excited. <laughs> but she was excited I, as it was happening. I love it. That's right. Um, oh no, ro- my rocket fell down. <laughs> that's not a euphemism. That's actually rocket raccoon on my microphone stand. But Look, I saw Brian and my rocket fell <laughs> my down. Rocket, no, that's not true. <laughs> no, I I know. It's I. What I do you have against Gwendolyn Christie? I man? can't explain it. I, no, it's not. It's honestly, it's not that anything gets. I, I felt I, that. I, I'm just. I, I'm just. I don't with you. like. I don't like how I feel. I don't like how Brienne is left feeling about that entire fucking night. I think it's a it's a shit show for her from the moment Tyrion speaks to this what should be a beautiful moment that turns into a fucking ugly awful moment for her where this man basically old yellers her is what I'm get, being led to believe I guess here being like I, go on get, get I don't I don't like you anymore like the the basically distancing himself after he's done this it's it just su- it sucks for her it's a shit moment for her and I hope that there's something that makes it I hope there's something equally important on her side that results from this as there is that results for him but i think it's a moment that's it's almost entirely about jamie lannister and at the expense of brian that's my opinion and and in my opinion i think it's a very strange thing to hang up on in the episode i feel like the episode has its faults but uh, it seems like such a i I like most of the rest of the episode but i did not i i was not a fan so we are we are going to agree to disagree um, I give the Brienne Jamie shipping a, th- a big emphatic thumbs down, and Ben gives it two dicks two, up, two Jamie Lannister gold fists up, because <laughs> that's how he does it with the golden fist. It's not like I even I'm not even that that passionate about the fact that it happened. I think I think that 
other people are. I, I just understand why it did. Uh, it's not one of those things where I was like, this has to happen. I'm not, I, I n- did not feel at all like like anything was unearned. That's all I'm all I Okay. Mean. Well, I, 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 did not, I did not like it, and I think... I just uh, don't think that you like the way it, it made you feel. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. It made me feel bad inside. It didn't make you feel <laughs> good. It didn't make me feel good. <laughs> I wanted it to make me feel make good. It didn't make me feel good so bad. But, but so few things do. <laughs> this is true. This is very true. So uh, let's get on to our main topic of the episode. And Ben, why don't you tell us... Uh, oh, and Ben's just dropping... Oh, a lot of things tonight. No, no I, this is the second time I knocked over my phone. Actually, the reason why I was grabbing is because I took copious notes. Actually, probably the most notes I've ever taken for in wow. preparation of an episode, which is weird because it seems relatively arbitrary considering the topic. But it is a favorite. And the topic of, is butt stuff in yes. movies, um, in popular cinema. Which uh, I've got Brokeback Mountain, and that's about it. Uh, what about uh, um, A Requiem for a Dream? We do have ass to ass. There is an ass to ass. I think that's. I think that constitutes butt stuff. You're right. <laughs> when I'm right, I'm right. Continue. But are we talking about the whole movie or just that one scene? I mean, it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any movie with butt stuff. Um, no. So what I wanted to talk about it was actually a, a kind of a subgenre of a genre, which is docudramas. Um, so docudramas now typically are at least corresponding to a true story uh, where we're watching something that happened in real life. And so the reason doc you doc, uh, where you're documenting something drama is the idea of dramatizing what essentially could be a documentary where you're actually casting at something that happened and showing it in a dramatized fashion. Okay. Now I think this, there are subgenres of that, which is sure. we talked, I talked about with Matt in our preliminary prep for the episode which was biopics are one uh rockumentaries you know if you want to talk about band movies and stuff like that where it's true stories um well, which we'll get into but I, yeah I, I i think that the reason there is a reason i wanted to broaden it from just doing biopics mm-hmm. uh which we if we want to later and we feel like this discussion needs a second life then we can maybe do a sub a a, you know, another sub episode of it, but well, yeah, no, and I think, and so, like, I kind of broke it down a little because I was kind of curious to look at sort of lists yeah. uh, on these things. And so, one thing that I don't think we're going to talk about, <laughs> especially after, uh, uh, despite Ryan's uh, objection to this, I don't know necessarily that we're going to go into sports. We could, but um, I kind of feel like biopics tend to tread familiar topical territories in each of these genres. So sports is going to be about a team that doesn't stand a chance to win and wins, You, you usually. Um, you're going to have politics, which is a scandal is about to rock the nation. And what, what? how did this scandal happen? Or how was a scandal unearthed or stopped or something like that? You have music, which is beloved music star, has sorted history with drugs and sex. Um, thriller, something awful happened and we want to understand why. So that's kind of where you get into a lot of those, which is mm. sort of kind of that in, in Cold Blood, which I think is really the inception of the the genre a little bit as far as, far as going towards sort of um, – Judgment uh, Nuremberg. Judgment – okay, there you go. That's a, that's much older than, than where I was looking at. But um, history, so you have just basic historical events that you're going to retell. Um yeah, I mean, Me, yeah, sports, war, war movies, exactly. Mu- and music biopics, um, and then, um, and then we we used and and we've gone through a lot of cycles with this. But I know that for a long time, you know, Lifetime has been a bastion of terrible made-for-TV movies about any dumb celebrity or situation or whatever, and they buy rights to things almost immediately after they happen and crank out a movie, which don't I don't think we'll probably be getting into those. But those are just kind of some of the genres I'd sort of looked at for this. A well, so bit. I actually approach it from a different perspective, not so much as the subgenre within a genre where you're talking about, like, is this a you know, thriller movie or is this sure. a comedy or is this one of those types of things? Um, the way I subcategorize everything was based off of viability as a docudrama. Okay. Because I wanted to completely eliminate the movies that are not – they're based on a true story, but they're dramatized. Okay. So when you're talking about A League of Their Own, Ed Wood, The Social Network, Catch Me If You Can, JFK, yep. Remember the Titans, October Sky. These are movies that are – Lawrence ba- of Arabia. Lawrence the of Aviator. Arabia. The, yeah, well, The Aviator is maybe a little closer, but um, – yeah. These are movies that are dramatized, very artistic takes on what happened with this singular person or with this certain event. And with with a lot of those, 
I mean, anybody who is has any sort of historical perspective and, or was there or has some sort of like, I mean, you could have a, but see that that's the complete difference is, is that there are lots of things where I feel like a sports movie may be very like miracle. I feel like is a perfectly adequate docudrama because it's like to the letter. I mean, sure. it's, it's absolutely 100% accurate from pretty much beginning to end. Hoosiers a little bit less so, but still the story is there. Yeah. I mean, it's, t- um, and it's look, and I think there's a fine line. I think yeah. there are things that we may like. So there's a movie like Lincoln, which can right, feel exactly. very much like a docudrama, but there's also but, but, a million but, but, people but poking a, holes and saying, no, exactly. these things didn't yeah, happen yeah, like, exactly. like this at all. And so, and so I, I, I want to, to shy away from the ones where we're talking about the dramatiz- dr- dramatization of, uh, of, an event and kind of creating a new narrative that goes around it to make it a more interesting movie. I was interested in the ones that were really trying to copy. And that's why you end up with a lot of biopics gotcha. because you're, you're, I, I feel like biopics are, are kind of the, or even the rockumentary where you're talking sure. about band it's because you're, you're ending up with these movies where you're following a certain character and you're trying to remain as historically accurate as you possibly can. Well, and you're, you're also – you have access to a lot more things, I think, with those. When you're dealing with a celebrity, there's a lot more, like, actual – there's footage. There are things that have happened sure. that are that are well-documented in their lives versus you do uh, – you, you want to do something like the movie Spotlight, um, which is one that I kind of right. – I put on my Absolutely. list to say that actually I think is very much – like a docudrama, which is 100%. not as not as as publicized necessarily, but there are the people recounting. Yeah, no, and it, and it was a, a that was a really big shock, not a shock, but just a really. Um, I was not. I was surprised to enjoy that movie as much as I did. I thought it was a really really good job. Well, I actually, I have a, a, one, a kind of a counterpoint to that one. One I yeah. thought was really good, uh, which I'll bring up is uh, Shattered Glass. Oh yeah, which. I've- yeah, did, did, it's did, on my yeah, list yeah, with yeah. Uh, Hay- Hayden Christensen. <laughs> yeah, well, directed by Billy Ray. Yep, not Cyrus. Um, but no, the uh, yeah, but, but a lot of the, when we're talking about these movies where you don't, maybe you understand the broader storyline, like oh yeah, there was this huge you know uh, pe- pedophilia problem in the Catholic Church, or yes, yeah, some guy got fired for the Atlantic for making up a bunch of stories. Yeah. Instead, they delve a little bit deeper into the character and try to find out the motivations. And you talk about all the people who were involved with that and like what kind of led up to that. And those are my actually my favorite kind of docudramas. Is usually sure. when you see the people when you know the broad strokes, but when you see the people turning the wheels mm-hmm. behind the scenes and when when the 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 movie is a deeper dive into that. And that, that's actually what I think makes makes a, the most compelling type of docudrama is when. You're working with when you're understanding a side of the story that you never uh, understood before, and sure. uh, and honestly, I think that that is a very common human condition to kind of want want to understand the underpinnings of it, and I think that that's cross cultural mediums now a lot. Where especially when you have these people who are obsessed with like true crime and things along those lines where they want to learn every single detail and they want Mm -hmm. to to break down things. I think now people try to sort of integrate themselves into these kind of docudrama sort of situations, especially with like the podcasting culture with what you Mm -hmm. have with like my favorite murder or like, you know, and like all of these different real or true, true crime stories. And then people do this insane amount of research and all of a sudden they, they become like at least self-professed experts on these different issues. And uh, I, I think I think it's kind of innately interesting in the human condition that we, we want to insert ourselves into these situations that we feel like – could have gone one way, but but have these strange. Terms. Yeah, I think we like to know what's un- we like to peel back the layer and find out what's underneath the exactly. superficial that we know about. So that and I think that's one of the reasons why biopics, especially, are always popular no matter what. Is everyone wants to know? You know, even something like um, Bohemian Rhapsody, which veers very far away from uh, many of the truths of, of what's going on. People still want to go watch and be like, how. Or how glosses they, over the Yeah, truth. like, how did they come up with Bohemian Rhapsody? How did they record that? What's going on? They, where did, why did this thing happen? Why does this happen? And people like to know what's behind it. And it's something that's interesting that very often you'll read reviews of biopics and they'll be like, they didn't get – we see nothing here that we don't already – no, we're not getting a lot of, like, that right. underbelly from it of what's going on. Now, I have, I have a question for you. Do you feel – do you know or can you think of anyone off the top of your head that – and maybe there's something on your list that falls in this category where it is not historically relevant as far as uh, – not historically not historically accurate 
um, as you're kind of talking about with the docudrama, but so perfectly in, in captures the character or the mo- or the facets of the character or something interesting about the character that you give it a pass almost to say this does actually give us something more than that. And, and I don't know if that makes sense to you, if that, that question or not. But. Yeah, I, I think that the uh, crumb might fall into that uh, category um, where you're – which is almost a pseudo – fictionalization of a character. Yeah. Um, and they did American Splendor, which did almost sort of the same weird kind of things. Uh, right. Well, in, in a very similar yes. kind of medium, actually. Yes. But, uh, I mean, we're talking about comic artists. It's kind of a small world. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I would say um, the only other one that I would think of that on my list is is presupposing what they were saying behind the scenes in Good Night and Good Luck, which we mm-hmm. did, which I love that movie. But we know what was said, you know, on air. Yeah. Uh, but 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 the machinations of what was happening behind the scenes there felt very constructed, and I liked the messaging gotcha. of it. But I still feel like it was constructed message very much on the part of Clooney. Yeah. Well, uh, I, you know, I give that movie a pass because I really like it. Yeah, no, and and I think the one that falls into that for me as well is Munich is also like that. Yeah, movie. I uh, man, do I love Munich? I put a big bold uh, uh, thing on my list for Munich, but yeah. um, one that actually is not on my list. I was just thinking of it right now, and you made me think about it for Good Night and Good Luck, which is Private Parts, um, which is a Howard, oh, Howard Stern movie, yeah. and that's a really interesting case where you're doing a movie about though. someone who you're actually casting the person in in the movie yeah. but they completely none of the things happen exactly in the quite the the order and some of the stuff that's going on it but you very much get his the ba- the main broad strokes of everything going on there and they combine some characters but it is a very interesting movie from a having also I re- I read that book and the book's completely not even in the not even similar I would say to the right. movie um, other than it, it recounts moments from his life. But um, that is an interesting one for me for, for Stern fans out there, I'm sure as well. Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting movie. Yeah. I, I was going to say like, we both love Munich a lot. I think we both consider it probably one of Spielberg's top yeah. three or four films, but uh, M- Munich is also a movie that's heavily dramatized and, and has completely unverifiable moments and sequences in it. But when it comes down to the stuff that actually happened in Munich, which was very docu- shot documentary style yeah. and was super highly accurate, you kind of forgive the rest of the movie for kind of presupposing that these other things happened or that these other things – I mean even though even though parts of it are verified, other well, parts are completely – Well, I mean and it's similar for Schindler's List and similar also sure. for Band of Brothers, um, which is sure. another one that's uh, that always wants to be – on my on a, on a list like this, but it's not isn't a movie. Why? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it doesn't. I'm not. I'm not going to contest yeah, of course. TV no, series not. versus movie because there is there's a series I do want to talk about actually uh, toward the end of this. Um, that is because there. I think what you're talking about with the podcast is now shifting into what what they used to do on Lifetime movies, but they're doing it better. And I'll get to that at the, uh, when we get through this. Okay, a little more. interesting. Um. Well, anyway, so I was going to say that my – when I was first looking at a list of, of a lot of the docudramas and biopics that I really like, I, I actually almost separated them. I, I said uh-huh. there, there are movies – there are docudramas that are, are straight up about a moment in time, about, about a certain event where everything crystallizes around that event and you want to find the underpinnings of that event. Okay. Versus uh, there are movies about a person or persons – and it's about finding what they're about and kind of finding the underpinnings of what they're about. And then there are a few movies that do both. Sure. Just a few. Like Lincoln, I would say, does both. In a, in a way. In a way. But, but I, I kind of discredited Lincoln along with those others because a lot of it's – Now, what about The Dirt? Where does The Dirt fall We're on this? We're not talking about The Dirt on this. <laughs> We're not talking about The Dirt. <laughs> that was an excerpt, by it's the way, from The Dirt. We, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was Tommy Lee coming. That was the, that was the first time yeah. they all did blow together. Pamela, yeah. Pamela, yeah. Pamela. Yeah. Um, but the. By the way, uh, the Dirt actually is one of our sponsors, so we are oh, contractually shit. obligated to talk about them every three, three episodes, three times. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, 
Well, so I was going to say the ones that have – that are more of, I think, about a moment in time and a certain event or something that happens and the ones I really like are the ones like The Insider. Oh, all the presi- so good. All the President's Men, uh, 13 Days, uh, which is a great movie if yeah. you get away from the bad accents. Uh, <laughs> you know, Shattered Glass, Munich, those ones versus the ones that are more biopic-ish where you're following one person like Malcolm X, Amadeus – Gandhi, mm-hmm. my left foot. Um, now, the ones I wanted to talk about, though, I think are the ones that kind of mesh in the middle. Okay. Where I feel like it's not – I had three movies that I kind of felt like really combine both the – a real-life event and encapsulation in time plus the uh, – some sort of narrative understructure of who that main character or who one of the main characters is. And the first I would say is Patton. Um, you know, Franklin Schaefer's Patton. It was co-written by Francis Ford Coppola. About Patton Oswalt. Uh, about Patton His Oswald. early years on the we're about, Yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> we're talking about General Patton. Oh, General Patton. Yes. yes. Just a general Patton, not a specific Patton. Um, <laughs> yes. Just, just, just that one Patton. Just and, a general Patton. So uh, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, Dex, uh, Beth's grandfather, you know, served under Patton. Oh, wow. Did not have nice things to say about him. Of course ah. he didn't. Because he was an asshole. Yeah. I mean, the guy was a notorious asshole. And I think that that movie does a really good job of in kind of showing the war and where it was now and why a guy like Patton was necessary to the war versus him being a complete fucking asshole. Hmm. And so I, I, I think it's an interesting character study and also an interesting kind of encapsulation of like what's happening at the time. And it's pretty funny because funny uh, Franklin Schaefer, who directed that movie – his only like real big studio movie before he directed Patton was Planet of the Apes. Oh wow, the original Planet of the Apes. But uh, then curtailed that to I mean he did Papillon a couple of years after that, and I mean Papillon's probably got the one of the biggest casts, one of the biggest yeah. A list casts of all time. They're re uh, they're redoing that right now with Rami Malek and yeah. Charlie Hunnam. Yep, not an, not as much of an A list cast as back then. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, our guest next week will be Rami Malek Rami and Charlie Hunnam. So we're sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, uh, another one I, I was thinking of was Hotel Rwanda, which uh, mm. Terry George, which uh, you know the the lead performance. Obviously, the Oscar was it Oscar winning? Did he win the Oscar? Or I believe he, he won the Oscar, but I'm not. Uh, we got to look that up. I believe he won, right? right? I thought he won. Let's find out. Let's find out. You keep talking while I uh, while I look this yeah, up well, on so the interwebs. So, so anyways, well, with Hotel Rwanda, I think it's interesting because you're watching a very crystallized moment in time where where you have two separate factions that are basically going into civil war against one another. But the movie is ultimately about him and his family, about Paul and his family. And I... I think that that's – it's a smart narrative device. Now, whether you want to consider that a biopic or not, I don't consider it a biopic in the traditional sense because you're not following him from a young age or anything along those lines. Yeah. But also um, – who this is kind of interesting by the way. Just for a pretty amazing factoid actually for – so that uh, okay. Hotel Rwanda up in uh, in 2004 Oscars – up against another juggernaut. 2005, 2005 Oscars, 2004 releases. 2004 releases. Uh, up against a ju- another juggernaut biopic. And that's why. The Aviator, right? No, Ray. That oh, was the Ray. year. So uh, so Cheadle lost to Jamie Foxx that's for right. Ray. Very interesting. See, we, we didn't even plan that, but we should have. <laughs> wow. Which is a – Ray is a pretty Actually, great performance. Even better, also up against so – here are, oh, my God. This is amazing, actually. This is uh, super amazing. Oh, my God. All five Best Actor nominees playing real people. Uh, Jamie Foxx as Ray Charles and Ray. Don Cheadle uh, uh, in Hotel Rwanda. Johnny Depp as J.M. Barry in Finding Neverland. 
Leonardo DiCaprio as Howard Hughes in Aviator, and Clint Eastwood as Frankie Dunn in Million Dollar Baby. Holy cow. That is a five biopic best actor list for Million Dollar Baby wasn't really a true story, though. That was a that was a completely changed story, though. But it's – well, it f- still falls in the yeah, – based no, no, on no, a yeah, true yeah, story, yeah, as we talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's one, one that would be immediately eliminated. Should have been a Lifetime movie. Well, it's by Clint Eastwood, so anything he directs that's quote-unquote true is shit. Uh, but that's just my opinion. M- Mr. Griver. Anyway. <laughs> American Sniper. <laughs> mm. Yes. Uh, can, uh, can, go on. Anyway, anyways, uh, then the last one I was going to say was uh, not in Cold Blood. It was Capote mm-hmm. because I feel like Capote is more of a character study about Capote, but it also features a pretty interesting narrative about uh, the events that happened, about yes. about the characters involved and his relationship with them, and also spans many years. And and I uh, Bennett Miller directed that movie. I I re- actually it's so crazy that Bennett Miller has only directed like three. He directed that Moneyball and Foxcatcher. Yes, yes, and and which is kind of amazing. He has something he's in pre production on right now, which is interesting. But um, yeah, Bennett Miller's a, a hell of a very very interesting, very very cold. <laughs> not to, not to, no pun intended, but is a very uh, calculated director, I think, in the way that he approaches his material, uh, even though it spans from sports movie to, you know, a couple of movies about people being murdered. Well, and, and what's interesting, so, um, so what's kind of interesting is that one thing that tends to happen oftentimes with biopics is they they there's a race to get them out. At some point, someone comes up with the idea and says, hey, I want to do a movie about such and such person. Right. Like we had the Freddie Mercury, Sasha Baron Cohen movie. And well, we no, no. It. I'm talking about movies that actually both get released. So, oh, okay. where, so you were talking about Truman uh, – talking about Capote. And there's another movie um, uh, called with, Infamous. With, with Sandra Bullock. With Sandra Bullock as Harper Lee and Toby uh, – Toby – Hooper. Toby, who no, is no Toby uh, Toby, Toby Jones, Jones Toby, Toby Jones, Jones. Uh, Toby Hooper, the director of <laughs> Poltergeist. <laughs> I'm Truman Capote. <laughs> 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 that was the geekiest <laughs> mistake ever made He's on like, air. <laughs> this house is clear <laughs> and fabulous. <laughs> um, no, well, and but so wow. But there's some heavy hitters in in Infamous too. Like you've got Daniel Craig playing the Lee Pace character, sure. that, that, where there's the the kind of the love affair between them. But I do like watching the, the same thing happened with Hitchcock. There's a Hitchcock movie, and then there's a and also with Toby Jones playing Hitchcock against um, uh, uh, Odin uh, and and Hannibal Lecter, Anthony Hopkins. Uh, you're right. Um, but there happens a lot of times you get these – you get a lesser actor. I guess it's almost always Toby Jones. So just, hey, don't call Toby Jones a lesser actor. <laughs> Toby the, Jones is a great he's actor. He's an amazing actor, but he's a, he's a less expensive actor than Philip Seymour Hoffman or Anthony Hopkins. And and in 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 fairness, also those are the movies that people tend to be talking about. Are the ones like, Helen Mirren's in one of those uh, in, in the Hitchcock with Anthony Hopkins. She's not in the one with with Toby Jones. But um, I do find that kind of interesting that these there's this sort of lightning strikes when someone wants to get a movie out. And my guess is that it, it's usually the 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 maybe the less. A-list names attached to it have been working, like, trying to get that movie done for 10 years, and they finally get up there, and then someone else is like, hey, let's do a Hitchcock movie. <laughs> I've got all these people on board. Let's uh, let's go ahead and do it. Yeah, I, I it really is, actually, that, that's kind of a funny thing to, to mention, because it, it, when you think about it, back into the day, it's like, who can get the first asteroid movie out first? Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, we can't do it. Who can get the first volcano movie out first? Okay. <laughs> well, now we're – who can get the first dinosaur movie? Okay. We're doing the dinosaur movie. Uh, but, we haven't and, seen it in a little while now. I think it's – but it's, it's close. It's still – it's still it It's still still happens. there. We have Toy Story 4 in Child's Play. So, I mean, that's got some crossover there. But, oh, yeah. Well, um, naturally. But, but it is actually kind of funny that there was a long time where, where – Yeah. You know – we would have two stories pop up, but that happened with Queen. That yeah, happened with, uh, but yeah, like I said, I mean, there there are multiple times where people are just like, oh yeah, we're going to tell this story. There, t- Tolkien that happened multiple yes. times. We have it this weekend. To- or the, uh, t- tomorrow, yeah, with the Nicholas Holt. Uh, the Nicholas Tolkien. Holt Tolkien came out, or is supposed to, is coming out, and there was supposed to be a completely different. 
take it's crazy. I mean, it's crazy. It just seems like, and I don't know what it is. If it's just like two pro- a producer getting the ear of two different people, or or two people getting the ear of different producers, or what it is. But we're just two writers having pretty much the same idea, and just yeah. I, I imagine that it's one that's been sitting on it for a while, yeah, and then the other then one it, moves in and like, oh fuck, I better yeah, like, yeah, we better like every time y- you and I see like a show that's d- doing dream writers, I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have tried harder, <laughs> but we didn't. Um, oh well. <laughs> uh, what else? What else we're do you lazy have on your? We live in Boynton Beach, Florida. <laughs> what, what else do you have on your uh, on your biopics? Uh, well, hold on there? one second. I'm, I'm okay. pouring my beer. Uh, right okay. Now. Well, okay. So I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna transition just a second, uh, kind of back onto the TV thing. Yeah. Um. So you know, for a long time, most of your TV movies based on a celebrity were pretty bad. They were either on Fox or Lifetime. Maybe occasionally you get like an ABC, CBS, NBC. But even then, they weren't they weren't good. They were weirdly cast, you know, with like a B or C list kind of actor. And you could tell there wasn't a lot of like work put into them. And then I think <laughs> something happened um, when Ryan Murphy did The People versus O.J. Simpson. And I, I think mm. The People versus O.J. Simpson for me felt very much – uh, it was like a product of the serial age, right? You were talking about the podcasts and the true crime. I think there was an opportunity to say, hey, this probably would not make a great two-hour movie, but like the reason why people will still li- they'll listen to 12 hours of a podcast on true crime, we're going to do that in in a television format. A serialized format. form, yeah. Uh, and serialized, we're going to show you this story for over 10 episodes and, and show you the real things going on in it. Well, so so I, I feel like that maybe for the like the true crime side of things is more accurate, but, but people have been making biopics for fucking forever. I mean, yeah, like, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm, but I'm saying as far as a TV, on a TV format and not a movie format. No, j- just on the TV. Of doing, well, I'm saying be, because the difference is that you have 10 hours or 8 hours or 12 hours, sure. which is a very different, when you, when you watch a movie, no matter what, you talked about kind of like, it's usually around an event and there's a reason it's around that event at times because that's all the time they have. Or they're going to do the the best of, you know, you get the best of Queen, you get all these, you know, right. seven moments that we get, we're going to hit upon, versus a a ten episode uh, a series can do it. And the one I'm watching right now and I'm fucking loving is not Ryan Murphy, uh, but it's Lin Manuel Miranda and a couple of other people. But it's the Fosse Verdon um, uh, biopic on FX, and it's Sam Rockwell and Michelle Williams fucking oh, wow. delivering. Oscar, nice. literally Oscar winning performances every week over like t- 10 episodes. Wow. Um, and I'm a big musical theater nerd. So I, I grew up, Gwen Vernon was probably like one of my first weird like crushes watching old 50s movies and things like Damn Yankees. But they're literally did going. Did you just make a 1950s reference? <laughs> I did. I did. Went, oh. I went back to pre code for, for Ben. <laughs> well, post. Matt still post Schenk, I am so proud of you. <laughs> um, I'm just so proud of you. I mean, I, I mean, Damn Yankees was, I was obsessed with that show, but um, it's a, it's a really fascinating look. First of all, you, you've literally got two Oscar winners just sure. like channeling. I mean, her, her Gwen Verdon is uncanny. I don't think I've seen anything like it. And she's got to do dance voice and singing um and Winburn had a very specific sound she she's kind of nailing it and and Rockwell obviously just always Rockwell delivering yeah. those things yeah always. but they do something really interesting that I just wanted to point out from a um a biopic standpoint and I I love this device I I instantly loved the device the first time they started using it they do supers before a scene so they're they're jumping around in time a lot in this which is pretty okay. standard for yeah, a lot yeah, of, of, of biopics and things like that. But all of their um their time stamps are related to moments that are integral to the the episode. So like they'll pop up a thing and it'll be like Oh, that's smart. That's like smart 14 device. weeks yeah. before his heart attack. 10 ma- 10 months before her Tony. Ten, it's, and then are there times they'll just pop up Bob Fosse and be like, and they'll give a stat count of like where he's at right now. Two Tonys, three Oscars, all these things. But they're all of these timestamps are like 17 years before this happens. Four minute, like all of these things. And I think it's such a, because you, you eventually learn where you are in these stories. You're really only going back to like right. three yeah, or yeah, four yeah, chronologies. Yeah, yeah, of course. But you keep getting these little snippets of, oh, there's this thing coming 
that we're not we're not ready for, or this thing that just happened, and this is what our reaction is to it. That I think is a really clever yeah, device. It's, it's I don't a, know who it, came up it, with that. It but. is a smart device where where you're like, well, we know what the expectation is. Yes. So how can we play with that when it, when it comes to? Well, and there's the, a lot of like things I don't. You know, I I knew a little bit about the history of them, but I didn't know a ton. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I if you guys if you're, you you want to watch a really like awesome 10 episode Oscar winner yeah. <laughs> on TV. I awesome. recommend Fosse Verdon a hundred percent. Yeah. I think I have to watch that now. It's good. It's real good. I really can't <laughs> say enough uh, good things about it, but I, that was why I, I got, that was probably the most excited I was when you said you wanted to do docudramas. I'm like, oh shit, I'm watching one that is like well, blowing me so, away. So I did want to talk about actually, and, and I glossed over it a little bit earlier, but, uh, I know we talked about like JFK earlier, and, and mm, uh, love me my JFK. I, I, it's your favorite Oliver Stone, isn't it? Probably. I mean, uh, I like, like Platoon. Platoon. Yeah. Uh, A lot of Vietnam vets yeah. don't like Platoon. No, they mostly like Full Metal Jacket. Um, yeah, but uh, I remember watching or that Apocalypse with... Now. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think JFK is just a I, – I'm a sucker for a huge fucking sprawling cast, long three-hour just – that's I like that shit where it's literally just people doing little monologue sets. That's really all it is. <laughs> here's John Candy's bit. Here's Donald Sutherland's bit. Here's so-and-so's bit. It's, I fucking love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, so with 13 Days, I wanted to – Bring up, I, I think that was a really interesting modern docudrama because apparently it played as close to the book as they possibly could. I mean, they, they tried to take actual affidavits from like things that were said in rooms and and, that and we should. And that 13 Days is about the Cuban Missile it, Crisis, a, yeah. I, I believe the movie came out in 2003, um, somewhere around there. It was directed by Roger Donaldson, starred Bruce Greenwood. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Greenwood was JFK, uh, J, uh. Um, his brother was, uh, oh, shit, Bobby. Uh, he was in Trick or Treat. What's his name? The Dylan uh, Baker. D- D- Dylan Baker. Yeah. And, but I would say that the main star of the movie is Kevin Costner, who's their advisor, who was a yeah. real guy. Um, <laughs> and, the real guy. <laughs> apparently, the, the 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 character was based off after, uh, after the real guy who was the advisor to the president. Anyways, uh, it's an interesting movie because. I have always been fascinated with the the Kennedys. I, hmm. I think in, in 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 office you have no shortage of fucking movies or TV yeah, series exactly. about them. You, you really don't. Um, but I think that 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 movie I find singularly interesting because it is a moment when the the nation goes into crisis mode. Mm-hmm. Or, and a lot of people don't even realize like the level of crisis mode that went into, which was then later declassified, and how many strings it took to be pulled behind the scenes that we that the nation did not not exist essentially after yeah. the eleventh day of that, uh, which is a, a really crazy story. Um, and I think it's really, really a well-made movie. And I'm, I'm not like a huge fan of Roger, Roger Donaldson's movies, but I thought it was a really cool. Uh, and the the casting's a little strange, and and <laughs> and you know having Kevin Costa be like, <laughs> I'm gonna talk to you tomorrow, you know, and and doing like a completely forced <laughs> Boston accent. Where I was just like, just let him be Kevin Costa. It's fine. There, uh, there, yeah, there, there, there are two things that are kind of interesting with that. One, I think. Um, I love the idea of doing something like that because you have a great luxury when you're dealing with JFK. Is everyone fucking knows JFK. Everyone knows yeah. the broad strokes of JFK. Uh, more than maybe almost – I mean that's in like one of those kind of top ten people that have just been everywhere. You've seen things. You've watched all this stuff. So I love the idea of doing something that's very specific in the right, – in exactly. Instead it's of just one, like – One moment in One time. moment. It's literally 13 – I mean 13 days. It's, a, it's yeah. in the title of the movie. Um, the, the other thing when you mentioned about the accents, because I that's also always a, it's always uh, unfathomable to me. It's harder when you're doing real people, but I'm always kind of I don't understand sometimes why we don't. And sometimes it's it's a British person doing an American accent. I'm like I don't understand why this character can't be British, and you can tell it's taking something out of their performance. But if you want something really like stupid. Fun, not fun, stupid to watch at night to help you go to sleep. 
Um, there's a really good series on YouTube that's experts that kind of talk about different things. It, it, basically, they'll examine – it'll be like a doctor talking about here's what, movies or TV shows where they're getting medicine right. No, it, but, it's amazing. But they do accents. There's this one guy that all he does is he dissects – Accents and he like and they're talks like of, thirty minute episodes. Yeah, they are amazing. thirty minutes exactly. I got my brother into these as well, and I'm like, you think you're like, oh, this is gonna be dry. It's gonna help me go to sleep. Like, no, it's fucking thirty minutes later, and I'm like, fuck that. No. I gotta learn more about how to do that. I I, 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 but I love his uh, his comments that like uh, when he's talking about like far and away. He's like, <laughs> it, he's like some lines he sounds correct. Some lines he sounds like Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it is it's he this guy is so dry and he seems it's funny is he probably should seem more then, arrogant to me but he really doesn't he's just like here's what this is and like yeah. this is a really good version of how they did this and here's where they're struggling like, a little bit he's like that, that that's the aslephic nerve in the back of the <laughs> note <laughs> and, and he's like he's like the back of the throat and, and you're using the top tip of the tongue <laughs> 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 And this is I'm not I'm I'm this is paraphrasing here I'm using you're just real close words. though <laughs> yeah I'm but, so glad you see this because it is oh, a, I love it yeah, it's he, amazing he's like he's like oh yeah well that's a glot a hard glottal uh, defect you see that when uh, I say my oh, T's sh- with my sh- tongue forward in my mouth sh- but he has his tongue sh- in the sh- back sh- of his mouth so it's like and I'm like this guy's speaking speaking Klingon I fucking I'm eating it up I'm like this is amazing it is so good it's so it's so much fun to watch but I I do love him especially like. Talking about people who are doing certain accents and 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 my favorite is him breaking down John Malkovich and Rounders, <laughs> which is one of the the most criticized. Uh, give the man his money. <laughs> 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 which oh. is not a biopic and it's not a docudrama. No, and uh, and also that is unless you're um, talking about when I went to Paul Manolio's bachelor party <laughs> in 2008. <laughs> That is – This will be the, the last of this tangent, but it just happened because you, you brought it up. If if you have not watched, there's a short like two-minute interview with Matt Damon about shooting rounders and about his first day with John Malkovich. And he said he gets to set and they get down and they sit down and they start the scene. And, and Malkovich does what we've all now come to see in that movie of just like, give this man his money. Like this all – this over-the-top – and and Damon's like, oh my god! <laughs> it's like, is this what he's really gonna do? And and Malkovich leans across the table. He goes, I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> and <he> goes, <laughs> and that was his like makeup where I was just like, I'm a terrible actor. <laughs> I, I think that is still one of my favorite Hollywood anecdotes of all time. But back to the biopics. Uh, what so what else do you have on your uh, your must talk about list here? Well, well, so for the most part, I, I covered the ones I I really wanted to talk about. But I I do like. Um, what I brought up earlier, which is Shattered Glass, just because yes. I, I, I like the idea of the the un, underserved story that we've never seen. Um, a, another one would be that I feel like would fall into that overly dramatized territory, which is the Constant Gardener, mm-hmm. but which is based on a true story, but it is ultimately very dramatized. But those are the ones I, I, where where nobody's really heard of. Sure, or they may have heard, like I said, the broad strokes, and we've talked about that. But what do you now? What do you think about Zodiac? I consider that a more of a dramatization. Interesting, because I, I, the the thing that sets it a little bit apart for me is, and I understand it's a swing a little bit, but I think Zodiac does a good job of trying to not necessarily answer. I mean, we don't know necessarily exactly who the Zodiac killer was, or we have a lot of hints and things on there, but I like that they do take a stand to well, say like, well, we're going to paint well, the this. Mo- the movie, yeah. the movie takes a pretty hard, pretty stance. hard stance. And, the, 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 and it, it seems to also be the is. consensus from research of saying like, well, this scene, this really was where a lot of things were pointing was toward this individual. Right. Um, so I think it's kind of interesting because that's a really tough line to, to, tread because you're you want to make this movie and you want to be true to your things but you also don't want to just put everything that everyone knows in it you got you want to have something that's almost that like we said people want to know what's behind something what is the thing underneath this the the driving force or or who or who did it i mean and that's a similar thing to where you know they don't necessarily do that in people versus oj simpson but that's another thing that'd be like oh hey there's this is the movie that says this this definitively happened, or this is our dissection of it, which is not completely dissimilar to what 
this medium is is kind of branching off of, which is uh, articles, right? It's about jour- it's journalism. So when you talk about a docudrama, it is supposed to be almost like a journalistic dissection of a moment well, in time it, or a person it, it, in time. It reminds me of being in film school, and, and somebody told me if, if you're making a documentary and you don't have a point to make, then there's no reason to make a documentary. Yeah. Uh, like and and which is completely counterintuitive to what I thought about going into it. Where it's just like that's the point you're documenting it so that people can see what it is. And but but they're like but what I was taught, yeah. What, what's accurate is that you have no thesis unless you have a point of view. And that's always interesting. And I've always and it's funny because I would use I used to say simplistically I don't like when there's too much of a bias in the documentary that oh, I'm watching, no. but. I think there are some that I think you can have a thesis, but the thesis doesn't necessarily have to be that's fine. A completely on one side or the other. I mean, you look at something like uh, uh, what was the one that was shot here um, about uh, uh, Kings uh, Kings Point? Kings Point is it called Kings Point? Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, Kings Point. Um, but th- that's a I think a really good one that doesn't necessarily there's not necessarily an angle to that. There's it more was a also thesis. A short. It was, it was this also is true. A short. This is true. This is true. But yeah, I could you I, see could you sustain that whole story for an hour and forty minutes? I don't think you'd want to sustain exactly. it for an hour. Exactly. <laughs> but it's yeah, it's it's too it's kind of almost just too sad, uh, ultimately. Exactly. It, and that's really what your thesis is in this. This is we can be we can laugh and we can enjoy the, some of these things, uh, but, it, but this is sad. ultimately this is a sad thing that we're looking at. Um yeah, and I'm trying to think if I had any more on my list. I mean I had awakenings on here because that just always reminds me of you. But uh no it, it I, I had a kind of a couple on here God that were it. just <laughs> if you have not seen Awakenings, by the way, please go and watch it and understand Robert De Niro, the, Robin Williams. Robin Williams directed by the late Penny Marshall, and the last five minutes of it is every time I've gone drinking with Penn Wilson. Um That's it, not true. <laughs> Uh, every not every time. time, every third. Yeah, you're probably right. Every four, maybe, maybe every four times, every quarter, uh, every, uh, every <laughs> once a month, <laughs> once a every month. nineteen times. <laughs> um, but uh, I, it's funny because when I was a kid, I was trying to think of like the first kind of biopics or docudramas I watched that maybe were on my radar. I know La Bamba was a big one when I was – actually, there were two with Lou Diamond I Phillips. Was, I it. was going to make a La Bamba joke earlier. <laughs> I was also going to make a Great Balls of Fire Dennis Quaid oh, joke. Oh, man. That was a TV movie. That's still a good movie. That's still a good movie. Oh, and Nona Ryder. Hell yeah, man. This oh, man. Cousin. Dennis Quaid uh, playing uh, – uh, uh, oh, what the hell's his name? Uh, uh, Johnny Lee Lewis? Jerry Lee Lewis. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry Lewis. Lewis. Um, is – Great casting. Also, just a terrible human being. Not not Dennis Quaid, but Jerry Lee Lewis. Um, but uh, it's funny. There were two that had uh, Lou Diamond Phillips in it. One was was La Bama, and the other was Stand and Deliver. Stand and Deliver. That's right. Which yeah. is a really good. And that's that's not a docudrama. I don't think you can know exactly what's going on in that classroom. But it's a pretty dry. I mean, there's not a whole lot going on in there that I feel is super super embellished. Um, but those are two really good ones when I was a kid that I kind of. I got into it. And the one I have to mention <laughs> for my brother, um, so you know how sometimes you have like just a moment in your life that's tied to something but for no good reasons necessarily? Sure. So if you ever ask my brother about certain like movie years, he can always tell you exactly when the movie Hoffa came out. 1994. <laughs> so hot. Well, there you go. You're doing very well. Um Hoffa was the first movie he reviewed. I'm right, right? I think you're right. I think it's 93 or 94. I think it's it's got to be one of the two. Uh, let me see here. Hoffa came out in... Tell me it's 1994, please. No, you're way... Actually, we're both a, a couple years off. 92. 92. 92. My bro- oh, my God. So my brother, was a, my brother was a freshman in college, and he was working for the Exponent newspaper at Purdue University, and the first assignment he was giving was to do a review... Of the movie Hoffa. So this – it's funny because this turns up in conversation with us probably once every couple months. Like something – I'll be like, what year was that thing? And he'll be like, oh, it was 92 because that was uh, when Hoffa was out. Uh, that's just like, Hoffa it's was always out. so specific to, to the Jimmy Hoffa, which is a biopic, by the way, about Jimmy Hoffa starring Jack Nicholson and Danny DeVito directed by Danny Dan DeVito. DeVito. Uh, which uh, I me- I remember that was also the first time when I was a kid. I was like, 
Danny DeVito directed the movie, but he's an actor. I was very, I was very surprised that this could possibly happen. That Apparently, actor... you had never seen any Robert Redford movies or Warren Beatty movies. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about that. <laughs> I, oh, I knew Warren Beatty. I maybe knew a little bit about uh, with Bugsy, but like Hoffa just seemed because like Warren Beatty though also seemed like this actor. Like Danny DeVito was like this TV actor that's all of a sudden directing. Like this big movie with Jack Nicholson, I was like, "What the hell is this going?" On? Like, what is this? But uh, not a not a bad movie, but not a great movie. No, it's not very good. Um, but yeah, not it's a uh, there's some good makeup in it actually. A little bit better makeup than uh, uh, Jagger Hoover with uh, DiCaprio, which had some really terrible, maybe the worst makeup I've seen in a big budget movie maybe ever. Well, if you if you want bad effects. When it comes to makeup or set design, then go see a Clint Eastwood movie, and that's how you. Do uh... you know what this this sort of again? Sorry, guys. T- tangent, just a quick tangent here. How is it that Marvel Studios can use a combination of prosthetics and CGI tw- twice in in two of their movies to age a character up? Once I remember the first time I saw it was when they aged Peggy Carter up in The Winter Soldier. And I couldn't figure out what I was looking at because it was, it was too good. And I'm like, they must have cast someone else, but it's like it really does sort of look like her. And I was trying to figure it out, and they're like, oh yeah. And I'm like, this can't be prosthetics. And they're like, oh no, 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 we don't, but, we don't do just prosthetics. And then we, they're like, just wait until you see Michael <laughs> Douglas. Yeah, well, like, so they, I get them aging down, but the aging up where they're using the combination of the two is where they're like, right. that's some shining moment shit right there. And that, like, I love that they do that with, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert again, if you've not seen, uh, uh, Avengers Endgame, when they, uh, age, uh, I just won't mention the character, but they age one of the characters many, many years. And they were like, we had to shrink the neck because no way an old man has that guy's neck. <laughs> Is, could be anyone in any of the Marvel movies at this point, so uh, not not too much of a spoiler there. But um, yeah, and I don't I don't think I had anything else on my list. I had a couple things like 127 hours, which is a oh, I actually did not a think of that. really That's a really good one, a really good movie, but really hard to watch movie. And I think there's some of those on on list. I, I found that movie actually inherently watchable. I really liked it. it I, like, like, I just mean the mo- there's a. a there, 90 seconds in it. That's... E- even those moments, I think, were done artfully enough. I, I really respect, actually, what Danny Boyle did with that movie. Yeah. Because I, I think that that's a, it's a brilliant take on a certain, like, a one-person perspective. Yeah. And yeah. it's hard to do that and make it compelling for a hundred and... Well, yeah, and the, hundred minutes, and it's know? and it's and that's also very difficult that there are biopics or there are not biopics or docudramas on moments that are not easy to watch. And one of the things I've not watched any of the um the 911. I didn't watch I did not no, watch I United haven't. 93. Um well, I haven't I've seen, seen that I haven't seen any of the Paul Greengrass stuff in that just cuz I don't know that I'm I don't know necessarily I'm going to get what I'm going to get out of it that feels like I need to well, so, get something so, out of it. So United 93 came out way too early. Mhm. Um it was very shortly removed from 9-11. Yeah. But it's a really well-made movie and and definitely worth watching. I, I would say everything else that's been made about 9-11 is pretty Well, there's, a, there's an Oliver Stone one too, right? Is that the one? What's the one with... Um... What's the one with Nicolas Cage and uh, and um, the firefighting one or whatever? Yeah, they, yeah. With uh, what's John his name? Travolta. No, 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 no. That's latter. Uh, That's, you're, you're, yeah. The the one I'm thinking of has the guy from. He's I know what you're talking Man. about. He's in. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I don't remember the name because that came out. Michael pretty Pena. Clo- Michael, Michael Pena. That's correct. Um, I know it came out pretty close, or at least I remember it coming out close uh, to it. Which is called World Trade Center. So that right. was 2006. So five years after. But that's yeah, the firefighters on there. Yeah, I I have not. There are certain ones I'm just not necessarily ready to watch. And like, and I know I'm not ready to watch because I can't like when there's like any anniversary of 9/11 and they do like the they put on the right. like round. I will sit and watch. I'll find myself watching something for six hours. Uh, and realize, oh, I should probably, you know, like bathe and go and do things. I just get kind of caught up in it. But that's a really tough thing to do to take these moments in history that are very 
near to us. And sure. and then try to think about it even now. Like now, then it just seems like very strange to do it at, at this point. It's kind of I think we're we're probably in that nexus of many years before they really revisit something like that from a historical uh, standpoint. And and that is, by the way, something I would be interested to watch. I mean, and I guess it's difficult without getting into super conspiracy type well, stuff. Yeah. But like, I mean, imagine like a thirteen days, but for nine eleven. Like here's here's the forty eight seventy two hour period around nine eleven with Dick the Cheney leaders. In a chamber. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you've got, I mean, you've got Bush reading well, the so book. There's a lot I, of stuff I, there. I, I uh, one of the movies that I immediately disqualified based off of my criteria was Elephant, which I mm. find to be a. I mean that that movie is incredibly affecting to me. Yeah, uh, and, and I understand that a lot of film critics will say that it completely bastardizes the the take of uh fandango but or fantango but uh it, it, the 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 concept of where it puts you into these long shots with these kids yeah. walking through these hallways and the way the way that that movie is shot and it, it feels very organic to me it feels very much like in the perspective of kids of being yeah. kind of just hopeless and and not armed in these yeah. situations to to combat, uh, you know, something that's just so completely random and, and terrible and destructive. So uh, even in that case, that that's something that's not based on reality. Yeah. I, I would put that outside of what I consider a docudrama. I find it super affecting. So, so – well, And that's sort of – yeah, and that's sort of what we were talking about earlier. That, that is something that yeah. captures a moment – it yeah. doesn't capture the facts, but it, it captures the, the, the yeah, moment 100. Yeah. percent um, Yeah, and that's and, and it is very difficult for me. And I think the only one I want to take like a total left turn on this right here. Uh, one of the other ones I did want to talk about that was on my list, and I'm curious to see where you think this falls on your spectrum as far as truth versus uh, just done for art, which is Man on the Moon, um, hmm. uh, which is uh, Milos Forman. And Jim Carrey doing the Andy Kaufman story. And it's uh, – I don't know where it falls 100 percent, mainly because you don't really know where Andy Kaufman fell 100 percent on some of these things. And we don't know how much of this is just more Andy Kaufman shit kind of murking it up. But I think ultimately it feels very real to me as far as kind of these moments and – the kind of the behind the curtains a little uh, to, bit of that to character. Me, to me, it feels like Carrie trying to emulate the best he possibly could of how Kaufman felt. Yeah. But that doesn't make it accurate necessarily. But sure. I, so, so I'm not sure where to class it. Yeah, it's, it's a really tricky one. And I, I remember that movie was um, – I'm still super impressed by – carry in that uh, or yeah uh, and uh, even though he's a, he's insane <laughs> i mean that documentary about the no, making of that no, movie is nuts. one of the best documentaries yes, i've so, ever so, seen in my life so <laughs> it, it, if, if you've never i don't care who is listening to this but <laughs> that's not true we care about every one of you <laughs> well, right but if you don't like documentaries and you want to watch a dic- documentary that you'll like watch the man on the moon the the Jim, making of the, making the it's, of, i forget it's called jim carrey it's it's a super interesting. It's on. It was on Netflix. I don't know if it's still. I assume it because I think it was made by Netflix, or that that was who actually picked picked up on it. Um, but yeah, it is a um, it is a jarring documentary yeah. about the making of this movie that was just kind of a living hell for a lot of people working on it and behind the scenes. Yeah. And Milos Forman just fucking literally like. Almost losing his mind and directing that movie. Didn't really direct anything after that. <laughs> yeah, I it it is. Um, and I remember I I knew something was up because I remember hearing about the movie. and I was yeah. instantly like super excited about that movie. No, and this is pre. This is sort of not quite all, pre internet days. All I knew in ninety seven, I read in Cinescape that Jim Carrey was playing Andy Kaufman, and I was I even told my parents I was like, Jim Carrey's going to win an Oscar. <laughs> I told my parents almost. <laughs> no, I, I remember. I mean, I was following the the making of that movie beforehand when it was, yeah. and it was down to um, Edward Norton, Nicolas Cage, and uh, 
and carry. And Norton almost got it. Norton, like, fought super hard for that movie. And he just got edged out by by Jim Carrey. And this doc – and so I remember I, I'd heard about that and there were like set photos they released when he was shooting with all of the taxi, the old taxi crew. And they they all look fucking ancient, but now they've got young Laka on there. I remember that was being very – like right. a weird thing to look at. And then it like went off the radar. And I kept waiting because they would shown that teaser, the great teaser, which is the Mighty Mouse bit that, that Kaufman did. They showed, I think they showed that actually during SNL right. like the bit appeared on SNL. And then there was nothing on the movie. And it was in like a vacuum for, I want to say like a year and a half, two years. Cause I mean, I'd be like, what's going on with that movie? And I was pre being able to look up online, like what's going on with that. Obviously now you watch this documentary and I know, Oh yeah, here's what was going on with it. It broke like everyone that was involved in the movie. Yeah. And I'm sure the editing of it must've been a fucking nightmare based on what they had from their shoots and everything. It's, it's insane. It is a really insane art imitating life, imitating art, imitating life kind of deal yeah. on that movie. But That's uh, bizarre. Uh, that one definitely had to show up on my on my uh, docudrama biopic list. But I think that's all I've got on mine. Anything else yeah, you want to yeah. uh, no, want get I'm, into? I'm, I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty well pretty set good. on my list. I, I will I will say there was om- there was a movie that for a while for just a a little while actually not a little while a pretty long while I think there was a movie that came out that broke biopics in general for oh, I, 10 years. Oh, you talked about who you were going to talk about this. I had to bring this up. And this is a clip from this movie, and I will ex- explain why this clip is amazing. We were nothing but grains of sand. That was freaking transcendental, Paul McCartney. Don't you agree, John Lennon? Yes, Dewey Cox. With meditation, there's no limit to what we can imagine. imagine. What do you think, George Harrison, of the Beatles? You know, when you're speaking of transcendentalism, it's like not so much of an answer, it's more of a question. And I, as Ringo Starr, I don't really... I don't care for meditation myself. I just... I just love to have fun, you know. This is a scene from the movie Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. Walk Hard did biopics so well and so mean to every degree that for... I would say for big mainstream music biopics, we didn't have a lot of stuff between Walk the Line and Bohemian con- Rhapsody. Consider a complete failure, but it was. But it it was literally you could feel people making these movies of like, oh, the critics are going to fucking destroy yeah, us because, yeah. and it hits on all of the terrible things that yeah. biops can do. Yeah, that, of course, and that scene especially is like the repeated mention of who the people are that you're watching so you can't you can't just have elvis in a scene with johnny cash Look out, man like you've got to like you've got to draw someone has to be like oh that's elvis presley or like thanks a lot for coming here elvis presley like you you've got to mention them by name you've got to constantly uh, repeat all of these things and there's this which which, <laughs> which jack why is elvis presley in that uh, <laughs> look out man all right chop your right now <laughs> <laughs> it's so good it really it, it is we've talked about it on our parodies podcast if you've not watched walk hard the dewey cox story i i can't recommend it any more than to say that it is maybe the best biopic of <laughs> of all time of, 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 of all of the every single Chris Christopherson, it's yeah. Bob Dylan, pretty much everybody. It, yeah, it is. It, they really just do a phenomenal job of, of poking at what makes most of the biopics just kind of <laughs> cheesy and, yep. and terrible. Uh, but thank you so much for listening yeah. to us uh, this week on the New Way Podcast. We're coming at you with uh, new episodes all summer long. It seems to be where we get our stride. So if you're, if you're a little bit worried that we're not, we haven't been producing enough in a row, if we're not just delivering as much entertainment as you want, get ready because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try to to give you some big old loads this summer. <laughs> what the fuck? Dude? I love it. Uh, so. Oh, <laughs> Whoa, so I, oh, I'm sorry. Big old, You're a motherfucker. That's big old, right, Nick. Big old loads of content. Uh, big old loads of content is correct. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the new way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>